Hello, everybody. My guest today is a former owner of multiple retail and hospitality businesses, founder of Integrated Workforce Solutions, as well as a number of six and seven figure startups. He is a number one best selling author in the business category, professional speaker, coach, and small business expert. He is an award winning businessman, entrepreneur, and he was named the business person of the year and has owned more than a dozen multi award winning six and seven figure businesses across multiple industries, including retail, hospitality, technology, entertainment, and education. He is a founder of Australia's largest cloud based rostering and payroll provider, IWS, as well as a founder and CEO of Australia's fastest growing business community, BX Networking. Please welcome to the show, Matt Alderton. Awesome. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks, Matt. Great to have you on the show today. Now, Matt, tell me, you've done so many things. In a fairly short time frame, where do you get your drive from? Well, it depends on the perspective of how short it is, I guess, but I'll take it as a short time frame. Well, I didn't want to ask you how old you are, so I guess. <laughs> yes, well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably older than I look, uh, and I've done a fair bit in probably the past uh, couple of decades, but uh, um, fitting it all in is, is, is probably one of the uh, questions I get asked more than anything else. And I know that it's, it comes down to what you focus on and what you give energy and what you give the most energy you get the most out of. Um, but uh, yeah, look, I've, I've done a fair bit over the past decade or so from retail and hospitality to tech businesses and, and training education businesses. And I find myself here um, in, um, what are we in 2020 looking at, uh, uh, you know, the, the fastest growing networking organization in Australia and, and now New Zealand, which is pretty exciting in a space that I love working in and that's small business. Uh, and it's a place that I know that, uh, you enjoy spending a bit of time as well. Vic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, where did you start with all this? I was looking at your, you know, the LinkedIn profile and, uh, one thing that I saw at the, at the beginning of your story it is a, there's a bit of commonality. Are you are you like a movie fan, uh, you know, uh, a fan? Are you, do you like movies, videos? So what's the story there? Because I saw that you were working at a in a video store. I am actually a big a big movie buff. I, I love my movies and I love film um, and uh, you know pr- pretty much everything about it. Uh, ironically, and I don't know if this was coincidence or not or, or whatever, but uh, my father owned a video store back in the eighties. And um, he, when he first started, he had beta and VHS in the shop and, and soon moved to just the VHS format and um, owned that for probably five or six years and got out just before they all made tons of money. <laughs> and uh, yeah. um, so he, um, I think he sold in 88, would you believe? But uh, then uh, in the year 2000, I was working, I was at university um, and I, I found a job uh, working in a video shop as a uh, manager, store manager. Uh, so I started there kind of in, in like employment status, like if you forget the fact that, you know, probably worked lots of shifts as a young bloke yep. um, with, the, you know, slave child labor from my parents <laughs> or for love, <laughs> as we do in family businesses. But um, yeah, I worked uh, in uh, the video industry for a couple of years there as a store manager. And then I, when I, I actually left there after a couple of years, but I came back to work for that organization. They owned about uh, 50 video shops around Sydney and um or, and new south wales and i uh was an area manager then an operations manager then gm for that company over a number of years and that's probably where my passion and love of movies really got embedded i, I loved i loved it for a long time i've enjoyed movies and film and and the whole genre but uh um that really solidified it for me and then i ended up owning a couple of shops uh in um in the 2000s so i think i Bought my first one in 2007, and my second one I bought in 2010, um, which is at the end of the uh, the value proposition for owning a video yeah. shop. <laughs> so if you own yeah, them the Netflix in the 90s, started. <laughs> yeah, if you own them in the 90s and the and the early 2000s, you made a, a good chunk of coin out of it. Um, my father owned it in the 80s, just before it, and I owned it in the uh, the um, 2000s just after they uh, made lots of money uh, but in saying that I learned a lot through uh, running a lot of businesses that had those video shops and I learned a lot uh, about how to run a good video shop so we managed to do really well in the shops that we had um, and uh, I still owned it up until 2019 so one year ago I still owned a video shop can you believe I sold it in January of uh, or the end of January 2019 
sold it by the way just putting that out somebody there. still bought it yeah yeah um probably more so for the retail space than for the video shop itself <laughs> yeah, okay, right. yeah <laughs> i was gonna say i'm pretty happy to have uh to actually have sold a video store i think i'm the last person in the world to have sold one but uh yeah good times uh, uh great industry great like just such an enjoyable industry and i've had lots of different businesses subway stores cafes um all sorts of tech and stuff like that but I love the video shops more than anything else. There's no other business where you get a new product like that every week and it's an exciting product and it's got, you know, Nicole Kidman on the front cover or Leonardo DiCaprio or something like that. It's uh, lots of fun. It's a good industry. I'm missing that. You know, back, I, I still remember when I was a kid, like going into a video store, it, there, was, there was something about it, like, you know, walking around the shelves and picking up a physical cover of a DVD or, or a VHS, even yeah. a, a movie and, you know, reading the back cover. There was something, you know, the smell, you could smell the VHS. There was, there was a bit of a magic to it and um, it feels like it's, it's not there anymore. No, well, you just don't get that on Netflix, do you? You can't browse that oh. wall. And yeah. Ooh, I remember people used to walk up and down the wall and they'd have a couple in their hand and they'd be choosing between a few. It's just not like that anymore. Actually, it's like that at my house because I have quite a few DVDs, so a couple of thousand DVDs I've got in my, in my house, in my personal collection. Um, so you can still browse a new release wall. Well, there are probably not many new releases in there now, but you can browse the DVD wall. Um, but it is lots of fun. But you know what it taught me, I think, out of uh, all my lessons from being in um, that industry. And I think it was my favorite because it was uh, an industry where a, a business where people came to enjoy themselves. They were at, on a Friday night or a Saturday night and they're, they're thinking about spending time with the family and having fun and enjoying themselves and chilling out. And there's a mood that's associated with that as opposed to many other businesses that has a real, so if you can capture that, like there's a real energy there. Um, but I know that a thing that really sticks with me from the video shop is that during the, like the, probably the nineties is when they made so much money, like the average video store is probably making, you know, 20, 25 grand a week. Their wages were about um, anywhere from sort of 15 to 20% of their turnover. Their cost of goods were about uh, 25% of their turnover. They had low rents uh, considering, uh, you know, in the time of in the decade they were in rents, you know, hadn't grown to what they have these days. And, uh, and all their other costs were very low. And so to think to have a, a, a wages cost of about 15% and a, and a cost of goods sold of about 25%, um, you know, you're still left with more than half your turnover after that. Um, you know, royalties and franchise fees weren't ridiculous and exorbitant either. Um, so you're, you're in an industry that had so much money flowing through it. And yet so many of those owners uh, went bust in the year 2000 and beyond. And it staggered me and it taught me something though. It, it, you know, it doesn't matter how much money you make. It's about the discipline that you have in the good times, just as much as in the bad time and knowing, you know, put money away for a rainy day and, you know, profit is about, you know, a reward that you have in your business, but a portion of the profit that you put, you need to be putting away for tomorrow to continue building your business for tomorrow. And look at where we are now. We're in the midst of um, one of the, the biggest economic downturns uh, in our history. Uh, and most people wouldn't have had a week's worth of cash in their bank um, to continue going. Um, and if it wasn't for the government, you know, giving us all uh, job keeper and all that sort of stuff to keep us going, many business owners right now would have folded, uh, which would have been devastating for employment, devastating for the economy, uh, and obviously for ourselves as well. Um, but the, the video industry is a classic example of that. It taught us that it doesn't matter how much money is in an industry, it's not necessarily going to be there tomorrow. Um, mm. And it doesn't matter whether it's a coronavirus that uh, kills it or whether it's Netflix. Um, and late fees didn't kill the video store. It was poor, poorly run businesses, I think. There were some great operators who did a great job, but I saw a lot of them go bust because they weren't ready for tomorrow. They were just thinking of today and driving nice cars and living in nice houses and, and mortgaged up to the hilt because the cash was coming in, uh, but not thinking about what tomorrow looked like. Uh, and they had plenty of warning you know, as opposed to coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And we're not just talking about, uh, uh, like you said, they were spending money where they should have kept it and think a bit more uh, on the vision of the business. Then we had Blockbuster, right? That was, a, yeah. that was a big chain. Have you felt that one? Well, so Blockbuster here was interesting because um, they were a big American chain that came through Australia and, and probably, and I was video easy for most of my, when I ran the, the 50 odd st shops that we had, we were video easy and I um, rebranded to, uh, to 
uh, network video when I left uh, and, and owned my own ones. Uh, but Blockbuster was the, the big brand in Australia. Video was Video Easy was the Australian brand, but Blockbuster just crashed worldwide. Like they just disappeared. They pulled out of Australia. They left their businesses high and dry. Um, yeah, classic. I mean, big lesson to learn there, right? The, the power of, of innovation in a business with them and, and you know the story of Blockbuster and Netflix. When Netflix was starting out, I think the story goes like, the the the, the CEOs or you know the, the the executives of Blockbuster like they're just laughing at it. It was just ah, this is never gonna you know. I, I think yeah, I think, worry about it and- I think they even had an opportunity to engage. If I remember the story, they, they had an opportunity to buy in at the time and they knocked it back. Um, in saying that, Netflix Netflix has lost money for many many years as well. So it's been a, a black hole of an investment. Mm. Um, and um, you know, there's going to be a bunch of uh, of streaming services that I don't think are going to make it uh, because it's a very competitive market and you've got some big players, Apple TV Plus, you've got, um, you've got, well, obviously Netflix is probably one of the, the strongest at the moment, Apple TV Plus, Disney Plus, um, Stan, Prime, and um, of course, all your free to air are all streaming their services now as well. Uh, yeah. So it's a pretty, pretty messy market. I wouldn't want to be in that game. That would be, there's probably a lot of money being thrown at it. And um, I'd be interested to see how much money they're making out of the streaming services alone. Um, I mean, you wouldn't want to be trying to start a new business, trying to compete with that. That would be, that wouldn't be a smart decision, I reckon. Mm, I agree. Now, Back to so running a video store, you, you mentioned a couple of you know the benefits of like the costs being low at the time and 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 also no perishables, right? It was nothing. I mean, there may be some drinks in the fridge, but that doesn't go off for <laughs> that soon. But bringing that to in comparison to hospitality, which you said you had a subway business, yeah. entirely different uh, uh, problems Absolutely. with that, right? Yeah, well, so subways and and so I had um, four subways and a couple of cafes and. Um, they are hard businesses to work in. So, um, you know, Subway, Turnkey, if I had have had one Subway and worked in that, easy business to run. When you've got um, nine different retail shops to run um, and you're running them under management with 20, 15 to 25 year olds running those businesses uh, for you, totally different uh, value proposition. Uh, but the one thing I do know, like I, I talked about uh, the video store having a 15% wage cost whereas your subway might have a 25 to 30% wage cost. Um, your cafes are having up 40 and 45% wage costs a lot of the time as well. And then you've got cost of goods sold. Um, so the video store, you've got 25% cost of sale. But then once you've rented that out, you're selling off all your excess copies as well and making more margin back off the back of that on an next rental sale. Um, um, so it just keeps, you, you know, you rent it out once, it comes back, you rent it out again. And so you're buying for that and then you're selling it off at the back end down to, you know, one or two copies to put on the shelf on the weekly shelves or whatever. Whereas in a cafe and a, and a subway, you can only sell it once and you've got to buy it well and you can't overbuy because you, you'll then have wastage. Um, but obviously like the, the big thing about cafes and, and subways, you know, you've got a 30 odd percent wage, a food cost in there as well. Um, so straight away, you're looking at anywhere from, um, so if you've got 30% of food cost and say you've got 30% wage cost, there's 60% gone straight away. You might have a 10% royalty or something like that. And if you don't have a royalty, you're probably paying more for your food. Um, so it's still, you're looking at, I think, uh, around 65, 70% just with those two factors alone, which leaves 35, 40% to pay all your other costs in your business, um, which end up, you know, often coming very close to um, break even. Um, so the average cafe on a good week might be making ten percent. Um, the video shops on a good week were, on a good week were making fifty percent. Wow. <laughs> like that's the difference in business. You, you got to run a tight ship then. You absolutely do. You, if you don't, you don't run a good ship one week, you you lose money. Then you got to try and make it up the next week if you're lucky. And, and that's the hard thing about retail and hospitality. So that all these businesses know right now with coronavirus that they're they're looking at losing money week in week out week in week out so that just adds and adds and adds and then they they go well when we open if if we're losing 20% a week or 25% a week um, or if we say we're losing $10,000 a week or whatever that number is um, they know they have to make that up time and time again which doesn't just cut into uh, you know their profit each time it might be generate you know it might take 
it could take them two or three years to make up the difference in that loss there. I'm a big believer that, you know, everybody should be paying their way and about, um, you know, a firm believer that the cash economy is a big killer for, uh, you know, people doing the wrong thing and, and not declaring their cash. But I can understand why people don't um, mm. declare all their income because they're not making it. They're not making enough. And, and I know that um, there's a lot of businesses out there doing tough, irrespective of the coronavirus, but certainly the coronavirus is, is you know, putting a lot of businesses under extreme pressure if not going to collapse them. Yeah. One of the big ones is the, uh, moving on to an online, right? You guys had two people with BX, a uh, big time. I mean, I know before B, before this happened, I mean, I know, you know, there was Zoom meetings, uh, but I think it was like once a week or once a month. So yeah. there was a big shift to, from going that to going weekly almost every day and some days going twice a day, having uh, one and a half hour meetings, right? Yeah, so it's great, right? So um, we, we had been doing it once a month, we were doing it and um, we were having the same number attend once a month as we now have attend, attend um, a couple of times a day, um, Tuesday through Friday. So it's really, it's quite fascinating because, uh, and you know, you've got to look at the silver lining out of every single thing and, and the coronavirus, although ha- is having a devastating effect on a lot of businesses, there's a lot of businesses that have done well off the back of it by innovating and changing what they're doing um, and, um, and pivoting, which is the term everyone's throwing around at the moment. Uh, but those that have successfully done it, uh, you know, may still be hurting, but they, they've created a stronger business off the back of it. Uh, so I know for, from a BX perspective, we've lost half our revenue overnight because we stopped doing events, but we've created a whole new channel of business, which is in the online. And so we've, it's really like a whole nother um, funnel for our business because people that would never have engaged with us before because they weren't in a physical location where we have meetings can now all of a sudden engage in BX and be part of that, um, that the online meetings and, uh, and then create opportunities to, to actually create face-to-face meetings as well. Um, and, uh, but what it's done, I think for the, for business overall is made people wake up to technology. I think the resistance that there's been in uh, business to using tech uh, is still so significant. Uh, and I know from a, just a coaching perspective, I, you know, when you're talking about things like uh, businesses using accounting platforms, like cloud-based accounting platforms, like QuickBooks Online, for example, um, the number of people using that kind of solution as compared to a desktop solution um, like an MYOB or something like that, or even Excel and, and putting their figures in there or something like that and then sending that to their accountant, that was still proportionately high at the uh, manual end as opposed to the cloud-based end. Um, whereas I think we're seeing a transition now where people are, are now forced to do Zoom calls and and meet online and to use different formats online to communicate. Even accountants are saying, don't come to my office. Don't send me your receipts. This is how you want it now. And people are much, they're much more um, compliant, I guess, with that and, and aware of the opportunities that are involved. And we've had people obviously through our online events that would never have come to an online event before. And they're like, this is amazing. Like, why haven't you been doing this for years? We're like we have <laughs> like, wow, why, how did we not know about this? And they just weren't ready for it, but this forced people to be ready for it. And it's done that across all of small business. And I think it's just opened the door for every business to really step it up and to create more opportunities for themselves. And some businesses have done some great work and created some really successful opportunities for themselves and their business for the future. But it's also, it's moved, you know, the consumer as well as the business owner in a really positive direction, I think. Absolutely. I mean, uh, from a fitness side of things, on my end, I've, I've seen an incredible shift. I mean, we've been able to very, very quickly move on to Zoom sessions. So we're running Zoom classes we're seeing up, you know, up to 30 people joining in on Zoom from their living rooms. And we're still able to coach their form, keep them motivated and still get that sense of community. Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's phenomenal, really. Yeah. And the big thing about this is not just, okay, this is just the workaround now just to get by because of this coronavirus. This is, like you said, this is now, people need to think about it. This is a new revenue stream. This is, this is the invention now. This is when we come back. It's not like you need to drop it. You should actually think about keeping it and add it as an, another, as another stream. Now, Absolutely. Um, we talk about BX, but I guess for the listeners, we should probably unpack it a little bit. I know in the intro, I sort of mentioned a little bit, but for those listening um, who don't know about what BX, BX networking represents and what it is, um, keen to unravel that a little bit? Yeah, so we, we define ourselves as business networking reimagined. 
Uh, so you might have been involved or been to some form of networking in the past. Uh, we are a bit like that, but a bit different or a lot different. And I guess the, the, the big distinguishing thing is we still run events like lots of networking events do. And we do fortnightly breakfasts and lunches and we do the online stuff. Uh, but the big thing that um, we really focus on at BX is helping create referral partnerships as opposed to selling to each other and, you know, the flicking of business cards and the looking at how many people are in the room and how many opportunities there are for people to buy from me. We really eliminate that so that the relationships we're building in the room and online are all about how to help each other and connect each other. And uh, we found that we get amazing results by empowering people to build connections from each other in the out, in their networks outside the room and then create the opportunities then to build referral partnerships off those connections, which create a steady stream of new clients as opposed to sporadic one-off opportunities here and there. And so we've created a format and a structure that really um, extrapolates that out in a meeting and uh, whether that be online or face-to-face. And we've got members that are, you know, generating six and seven figures off the back of their, their energy and time with the connections they're building off the back of our networking events. Um, but I guess, you know, that is kind of the, the structure and the format and the result. Uh, but really, we are a, a community of business owners uh, from spread across Australia and New Zealand uh, that come together regularly online or face to face and help each other. And uh, I think that's where the stickiness is, the, the power of, of BX is in the building of that community. And it doesn't matter. We've, we seem to have people that are, you know, really close and they might be close geographically and good friends and, and a great community. Then all of a sudden um, they've, they've got contacts across the other side of Australia and in, in, in Perth or whatever that they might be working with in a collaboration as well. And it's, and it's, it's really, um, it's quite amazing. It's quite, you know, rewarding to be part of and to be leading it. Uh, and seeing people, you know, grow their business off the back of these relationships and the collaborations that happen through the network. And anybody listening to this, if you have a business in Australia, I highly recommend it. You know, I've had the experience both pre-COVID-19 when it was, you know, over here in Canberra, going to different, I think it's in, there's five chapters that we've got, Gangalin, Braden and, and whatnot. And, and the chapter that I used to, or chapter group that I used to go to, you know, in Braden, <laughs> in Gangalin, you know, it was, it was great because you, you go for a brekkie uh, once a fortnight, you get to, you know, see other business owners face to face, you know, you, you have a bit of a laugh, you get to know people on a personal level, you get to... Uh, build stronger relationship and trust. And so when you build that trust, um, you know, when people know, like, I can trust you, then they're more likely to refer you and more likely to, um, you know, to, to that relationship to, to build into a, a proper re- referral partnership. So I definitely enjoy that. And I've definitely seen that very effective uh, for my own business. And now, you know, doing the Zoom, it's like, it's, uh, uh, it's different, but also I would say even better maybe because like I think it's say faster. Yeah. Faster, I think yeah. It, yeah. Cause you really, you can, whereas in a lot of meetings face to face, you're creating partnerships and collaborations with people outside the room. A lot of them are already on the call that you can build partnerships with. So you might be have a referral partner that you've um, you might be looking for accountants to collaborate with. There could be two or three accountants on that particular call spread from across Australia that you've never met before that create that collaboration. And that you seem to get faster traction off the back of it. Um, and uh, the other thing you mentioned was breakfast and lunches. And so I guess that's, uh, I'm a big believer that uh, if you come to a, an event, you should get barista made coffee um, as a standard these days, and you should get to choose your breakfast and have a la carte breakfast. So we are passionate about uh, the food that we put in front of our people as well. Um, and, um, and certainly, you know, from a, from the person who's going to four and five meetings a week. Uh, I'm also liking to choose my meal and have a great coffee. Uh, so it's one thing we do really well at BX is choose fantastic venues from across Australia, uh, who will be very excited to go back into soon as well when they're all allowed to host our events and stuff like that. But uh, absolutely. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's their income, right? They, they definitely, they're looking forward to that. Now, somebody out there listening to this, they still might not actually get the benefit of it. it you know, the, the whole idea of networking. I mean, to me, I think, the biggest thing here is that um, it's like word of mouth. I mean, we are herd species, and people need to know you. If you if you if you're doing an advertisement, you know, in newspaper, it, it it it's it's lacking a couple of important things. It's lacking, you know, the voice, the tonality. You know, the you can't really replace it face to face. You know, uh, uh, you know, expression of who you are and what you do. And so, I think that is the biggest thing. Is there anything else you'd want to add to that? 
Well, I suppose um, the, the two kind of elements to what the value proposition that people get is one that uh, I always say to people that we don't sell to each other at BX. Uh, you know, we don't want a salesy kind of environment with our members, but people buy from each other all the time. So obviously, uh, once you build that relationship and you can know, like, and trust people through um, networking and, and working with them on a regular basis, people will buy from you. That's just a no-brainer. Uh, you know, people once they've got that relationship, they're going to be looking for the people they know, like, and trust to buy from. Uh, but the other element is definitely the referral relationships. And that's, once again, a relationship that, that you build and you can't build that uh, via email or anything like that. That's, a, once again, a conversation that you need to have. So you've got the tonality and the understanding and you're building a relationship as well because, you know, that's not just something you can make robotic, even though you can systemize and structure it so that it's a regular conversation you still need to be on the phone with people on a regular basis to continue a relationship so that they think of you, you're top of mind and they are referring to you because your referral partners do refer their clients to you. That's, that's the purpose behind it. And they're not going to do that if they don't have a relationship with you in the first place. Now looking at, uh, you know, talking about uh, ideal referral partner, who should the ideal referral partner be? Yeah. So everyone obviously has a, a potentially a different referral partner, uh, and the easiest way to identify your referral partners is just think about who your clients are and then think about another business that's also serving those clients as well. And then that obviously doesn't compete with you. And that is um, generally going to be a good referral partner for an, for an example, or I'll do some obvious examples and uh, then you'll be able to work your way back from uh, the business you might be in. But if you're a mortgage broker, you're typically helping people secure money to buy a home. And uh, so who else is helping people buy homes? That would be a real estate agent. So you would think that a mortgage broker and a real estate agent would have similar client bases. So if, if these two people were talking to each other on a regular basis, say every fortnight, having a quick catch up and seeing how they could help or connect each other up on a fortnightly basis, that would keep each other top of mind, which meant that uh, when they had their ideal client and somebody who said the real estate agent, or oh, do you know a good mortgage broker? They would say, yes, I do this person because you're top of mind and vice versa. When you're, you're, you're sitting in front of your mortgage broker and you're talking about uh, buying a home, they should, they'll say, Oh, well, you should speak to this person because they're the guru in that space. And they, they know a bunch of great homes in your local area, et cetera, et cetera. So they're going to naturally refer. Another classic referral partnership might be a business coach. Um, and a business coach is a great referral partner for many B2B style businesses. Uh, for example, if you're a marketing person, just say you do SEO, uh, you would be talking to businesses about growing and scaling their business and about investing in marketing. If you're a business coach, you're talking to businesses about growing and scaling their businesses and investing in lots of different things. So one of the questions you would be asking and talking to your coaching clients about is, what sort of marketing are they doing? And that's a natural connection, therefore, back to the uh, SEO company. Uh, and likewise, the SEO company would be saying, you know, how are you going with the business? What other marketing? What other things are you doing? And they would ask the question, do you have a business coach? You don't have a business coach. I reckon you really benefit from um, getting some structure around and some strategy around what you're doing across all the areas of your business. And they could connect you up with a business coach. So it's really prospecting your clients on behalf of your referral partner so that your referral partner doesn't have to do any selling. They're really just getting a warm client put in front, a warm lead put in front of them that they can just have a conversation with and they'll know straight away whether that it's going to go to the next level or not. Rather than having lots of sales conversations with people that are maybe interested and maybe not, you're having only genuine conversations that are having a high yield, a high um, conversion rate. And you'll be surprised that um, out of it, generally out of every uh, referral partnership, you'll generate about 20K a year worth of new business. And we sort of work uh, with our clients to help them get five to 10 new ones every single year, uh, which generally gets about 100K to 200K in new revenue per year um, on top of what you built last year. And then you'll add to that next year. So if you're adding one or 200K worth of new business every year to your business, um, you know, on top of the income you're already doing as, as a business anyway, um, that's, a, that's a pretty good incremental um, growth in your business. Not to mention, you probably will be doing some other forms of marketing, which will be driving revenue as well. Uh, so, you know, if, if, they, if they're spending time on networking and they're, and they're spending time on their digital marketing and they're um, maybe doing some PR um, and they're getting all their pillars of marketing into place, you know, you should be able to generate, you know, a good and reasonable um, increase in turnover every year. A couple hundred grand out of networking, a couple hundred grand out of this, a couple hundred grand out of that. Um, you know, within a few years, you'll have a million dollar business and growing. And really, that's where you want to be aiming for. Businesses should be aiming to get into that uh, seven figure 
uh, point within that sort of first five years. And that's, you know, a good sustainable growing business because every business is a bit different. And I'd probably say, have a conversation with a coach. And if you need a referral to a coach, I can let you know about that too. <laughs> Got some great ones in our network. And another good example could be like in a, in a trades shop, right? You can have an electrician and a plumber, right? That could be a referral partners to each other. Absolutely. So just whoever's already serving your clients. Yeah. So a plumber would be serving, in, in, you know, home services, anybody in those home services, builders, plumbers, electricians, spark, like, yeah, they're all fit into that. And so you just got to think, and you would have easy, probably 10 plus referral partners. Some would be really obvious key ones and some would be less obvious, but generally they'll all return about 20K worth of new business per year, every year, which is the great thing that I love about BX is we're helping people build businesses, um, not just that is the link to their um, membership. So it doesn't, you know, when you leave BX, you don't lose those referral sources. They stay with you for as long as you nurture those referral partnerships. Whereas lots of networking, um, the growth and the referrals are linked to your membership. So you leave, so you might be a business coach. Once you leave that uh, networking organization uh, and somebody else steps in as an, as the business coach, they start getting the referrals and you stop getting the referrals, which means you've got to continue to invest in your membership uh, for the return in referrals. Whereas I believe that really you should be able to build a sustainable model that's not linked to a membership. It's linked to your input into those relationships, um, not linked to the financial input into a, a third party. Uh, it's like SEO, you know, like you build it. Um, and if you build it, they'll come, but you know, you don't have to invest the same capital in every year to get the same results. It's, it starts to build itself once you uh, put some of these strategies in place. I think it also comes across as a more uh, as a more ethical business model where you you as a you know yourself with BX you come across as somebody who's trying to not genuinely help. You're not there saying I oh, you know I'm only going to help you as far as you keep paying kind of thing. Yeah, well we're we're education first and events second, and we built BX uh, before it was even called BX. I was. Um, doing small business education, running events with five, 600 people or, or even 100 people and 50 people um, doing small business education. Uh, and then we created BX and we continued doing that. We we're doing 12-month programs and we the networking became part of it and it's actually become the, the biggest part of our business now uh, by a long way. But um, our, our, our culture and ethos is around helping and, um, and building small businesses and, uh, you know, when you've got that at your ethos, it means that you're not focused on how to, um, you know, get as much out of a member as possible. You're focused on how to give them as much as possible, uh, which in turn will flow back if you believe in karma. Uh, but um, we, we are strong believers that, um, you know, the more we sell into our members, the more valuable we make ourselves anyway. Um, and we know we've got, you know, 1%, no, no greater than 2% churn rate in BX, which is crazy, right? Like it means we retain 98% of our members um, across a 12 month period. Like we are, which is why we've grown 300% in a year. Um, so like, because we, we are constantly focused on putting value back into our membership as opposed to what can we get out of each and every member? It's not about, you know, screwing it down to the minute sense, like you might've in retail and hospitality. Um, it's a different ethos with BX. Now, Matt, I know you do a lot of work for small business and I know you, you know, you also frequently lobby with, with governments um, uh, on, on behalf of small business owners. I believe you've even had a, uh, a conversation with prime minister and really pushing that message um, for the government to look after small business. There could be many other business owners, you know, who had, you know, who have, you know, had franchises and had different businesses, but they don't do that. So oh. what inspired you to, to be that voice? I guess, um, so I think from a family of small business, that probably uh, has shaped a lot of my feelings towards um, being in business and about helping and being part of something bigger. Um, and we were talking about it earlier before we um, kicked off the show here today. We were talking about um, that it's in you as an entrepreneur. And even when I was a business, like when I was an employee, I had an, an entrepreneurial spirit and I was, and I think that served my employer because I didn't, I weren't, wasn't counting my 40 hours down the clock. I was, I was working like it was my own business, but having owned my own business and, uh, and businesses, and I think I've uh, 13 or 14 um, businesses overall I've had um, having owned all those. And, you know, I've had some, amazingly successful ones, uh, BX being one of those, um, you know, IWS, um, you know, will be over eight figures by the end of um, sort of next year or so. 
um, like so these businesses are, are, are been amazing and, and, you know, at least, you know, you're doing something right. Um, but I've made some pretty big mistakes as well. Um, I've had, and I've had some pretty big setbacks along the way. And it's, it's through those that I've learned more than building the successful ones. I've learned more off the back of the failures that I've had. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's an amazing lady by the name of Terry Hawkins who said there's no failures in life. There's just feedback. Um, so I'm quite happy to think of it as, as really good feedback. Uh, yeah. and I I've learned, I've learned a lot from that and, and it allowed me to take all that and then sew that into the lives of others. Um, and, and I'd much rather teach someone, uh, through the, uh, the failures that I've had or the feedback I've had. Um, and give them that wisdom and let them make less mistakes than I've made. Um, and I guess that's part of the community spirit that we have with BX and, and what we do there. But one of my biggest setbacks uh, would have been uh, I had a business partner in one of my early businesses who uh, defraudulently took uh, about three, well, about half a million bucks out of the business. Um, and then we got slugged with about another quarter of a million bucks in, in penalties and interest because the money that he took out um, he was supposed to have paid um, ATO and super and stuff like that and didn't. And we got slogged with it. Um, so it cost us about three quarters of a million bucks. It took us about a decade to really get over it. Yep. Um, it took us, you know, a considerable time to pay it back. And, and really, you know, the, the impact, uh, the impact is probably lifelong in terms of financial because you never have that time back um, when you've had to, it's like when I was talking about the retail and hospitality businesses, it's going to cost them two or three years in their business um, of, of making money and, and, and the reward for that investment they've put in there. Um, and some of them might have not even had leases long enough to make that money back. Um, and it's, you know, I look back and I think, well, that's probably a decade out of my life that that cost me, but I guess the positive and you've got to find a positive, otherwise you don't get up out of bed in the morning and keep going. But if <laughs> once you find the positive and that is, and often it's after the fact that you can, you reflect on and get more positive, uh, but it's the lessons. It's the lessons I've now applied into other businesses where I haven't then made the mistakes that I've made back then. Um, I've been much um, slower to trust, um, which is good and bad, but I'm, I'm much wiser to trust, I suppose, is, is probably the thing. I, I think back then when I took a partner on, um, I just saw the opportunity. I didn't think of what are the pitfalls, what are the things I should be overseeing. Um, and probably the biggest lesson out of all that as well is, um, it's the people around me. Who am I taking my advice from? Um, because the advice I was taking early on in business was from a local, um, almost retired accountant um, who had um, who had plenty of years of experience of doing personal tax returns for people and doing um, and maybe a few small businesses in the local area, but he was not um, not broad enough. No, not broad enough. Not understanding of enough of of um, businesses of a certain size and growing. Um, and probably had no other retail and hospitality businesses under his portfolio. Um, and of course he used to do my personal tax returns because he did my mother-in-law's tax returns. And I just ended up using him just through that referral. And, and, uh, and each accountant I've had for a long time, I, I had for a long time, but, um, I had it for too long probably as well. So I should yeah. have made the next step to the, the, uh, the next one before I did. Um, and, it probably costs me as well in decisions that I've made. So I, and uh, lawyers would be exactly the same conversation. So I think those professional advice people, business coaches, another classic example. Um, so wherever you're getting your advice from, you have to think about that, you know, we're with people for a season, a reason or a lifetime. Um, there's very few lifetime people that we're with in our life. Um, so it's a season or a reason um, and I, I, I can see, and I, um, when I look and think about the people that I've had around me about when I should have moved on because, and I didn't for a variety of reasons, you know, relationships and I felt like I maybe owed them or um, I was going to say emotional better. attachment sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But I think, um, ultimately I, I can pin, you know, the cost of some of those along the way as well. Um, and it's easy to attribute. Uh, the accountant and the lawyer are probably two big ones um, that we should be thinking about. Are they serving us right now? And are they doing, are they, are they at where we're at now? And are they going to take us to the next stage? Cause they might be okay for now, but if they're not going to be able to take us to the next stage, then it's probably worth having a think about who are our next stage, our next season um, people that are around us because we are the average 
of the seven people we spend the most amount of time with. We, we you know, we take where we take our advice from. We, we, by osmosis, we, we take on and we absorb the wisdom of others around us. And if we're not around, around enough great people, um, we're not the best that we can be either. And that's probably the biggest lesson I've taken out of all my businesses. And oftentimes with, with family and, and, and relationships, that can also be the, the culprit because there's a big emotional attachment and, and those people mean the best for us. They love us and they, they, they generally want to help us, but uh, the advice is not often the one that you should listen to, uh, right? Definitely. And I guess it's a leadership thing as well. Um, it might be an employee that, that you've got um, or a team member that's with you that you think, you know, this person may have been great at the time, um, but at the end of the day, we don't, we shouldn't be making decisions just hundred percent based on personal feelings and emotions. Mm. We should be doing things. What's, what's the best thing for everybody here. Um, and that's often to move on, um, you know, season of reason in a lifetime. It's a, it's a great analogy to think people don't need to be with us forever. Um, and it's okay to move on. And that's the same for marriages and relationships of any kind. Um, so hopefully my wife and I were good for a lifetime. Um, I think we are over 20 years married now with three kids. We're doing pretty well. Um, but you know, it doesn't mean you gotta, you can just, you know, that's okay. And, and hope that hope that it continues on. You're still going to work hard at these things. Um, as is you've got to do with any relationship, whether it be in business or life. Yep. Mm. Now, another uh, technical question, more businessy. You've had an experience with both uh, starting business from scratch. I believe you had a coffee shop as well. Did you start from scratch? Yeah. But then you also run a franchise. You run a couple of those subways. So um, how, what, what are pros and cons of sort of both? What, what pros and cons, cons of both other businesses have you personally experienced? So I started, out of all the retail and hospitality businesses, I started... Um, so I took over two video shops. I didn't start them from scratch with, um, the subways. I opened, uh, three of them and, uh, I started and I, and I bought one existing and, uh, with the coffee shops, I, um, started both of those, um, BX from scratch and, um, and IWS from scratch as well. Um, so most, most from scratch. Um, and, that, and that's probably the, best if, if you've got something and these days it's pretty easy to open a business from scratch um, but the big difference between like a subway um, whether you're taking it over or starting it from scratch they're, they're really turnkey operations even when you're starting it from scratch and you're building it you're given um, you know the lego kit to, to build yep. it from um, you're even given the builders and stuff like that so that's they're really easy businesses to start off with and i'd probably recommend you know if someone wants to get into business and they've got no business experience, then that's a good place to start because they help you do your business planning. They help you. They do that regularly with you. They have um, a team that come out and visit you once a month and, and, and work through, you know, your restaurant for yes, health and safety stuff, but they're also helping you grow your business as well. Um, whereas lots of business owners go into business now and they've got no idea what they're doing. They've, they've never owned a business, never done any kind of education in terms of running a business. And then they go and open one. Um, and then they realize, um, you know, they love serving customers or love doing what they do as a trade, but they're actually not good at running a business. And this is probably the number one reason most businesses come unstuck is just, they're just, they're technically fantastic, but they're um, at the actual business itself the running of the uh the books and the accounts and the legal framework and the hr and all those bits that uh don't actually apply to the product or service they just how to actually run the business itself they're not good at that and they don't have much experience they might be good at one part of it but they probably suck at another so it might be yeah. good with the team and that but they might be terrible um at the accounts or vice versa and that's where lots of business come unstuck because they just they let those areas fall over and they they become very costly um, you know, cause you, there's legislation that binds you, um, uh, with a lot of these that if you don't do it right, it can come back and bite you in the ass down the track. So you gotta be very careful. Um, and, but it is pretty easy to start a business these days. If you're not brick, bricks and mortar, then it is super easy because, you know, you can start it from your, your home office and, or your, your lounge room or whatever, and, and you kick it off and you're off and running up and running. Well, it, when you think about that, uh, if you've got something you can do like that, that's fantastic. Uh, but what I, the, the challenge I would always set for people is that do it right. Even if you're going to start it from your lounge room, you know, you need to know what your turnover is going to look like by the end of, you know, this month, this quarter, this year, next year, five years, put a business plan to pray, put a business plan into place, treat it 
like you're spending, you know, 300,000 bucks on opening a Subway restaurant. Even though you're going to be given the structure down the track, still treat it like you're spending the money up front. Because I think that when people aren't spending the money up front, they think, oh, well, there's no risk. The problem with, is when there's no risk, they don't put the same level of effort in. And when there's the effort's not there, the, the structure and the discipline to achieve the results isn't there either. And lots of people, an excuse the saying, but they fart us around for two or three years earning less than the minimum wage. And I can safely say this because half of small business, so those earning under um, less than a couple of million bucks a year, half of them earn less than 50,000 bucks a year less than 50,000 bucks a year. And let, let's assume that the 50K is about minimum wage. Um, let's like, that's under minimum wage. Like, why are we doing that? Why are we risking, um, you know, our future, uh, probably not paying ourselves superannuation, all those things to earn less than the minimum wage. We might as well go get a job, work for 40 hours um, in um, a supermarket or something like that without any responsibility and be able to enjoy, you know, every minute that you're not working rather than be stressing about trying to build your business and probably working 60 hours in it. So uh, knowing what to do, when to do it, getting the right structures, having the right people around you and um, being having the discipline. Um, like I've worked from home from um, through this coronavirus but I start my day at the same time. I end my day at the same time. I, I set daily goals. I set um, myself actions for the day. Um, if, and if I'm not achieving those, you know, I might do a bit of work in the night to catch up. And, and that, that's cool because um, you own your own business. But that's a discipline as well. If I just, you know, was whatever, you know, far asking my way through the day and, and week, then month, then year. Um, you don't know where you're going. No, that's right. And and how can you possibly have a business where you actually have no idea of where you're going and, and how far, fast and how long it's going to take to get there? And yeah, so discipline is probably a big thing that people need to really put into place and have a, the goals set in place. And I have my goals up on my wall in front of me. My, my, I have my weekly in front of me on my desk. I have my quarterly, my annual up on a wall in front of me. Um, and so I'm reminded of where I'm going. I know where I'm, I know what I'm trying to achieve. I know what I'm trying to achieve it. I cross it off when I get there. Um, and you've just got to have that discipline. Like you've got a boss who's, who's sitting in another office, who's got those expectations of you as well. Uh, yeah. Because you do, the boss is the ATO <laughs> or the bank um, and they've got expectations, but they don't come knocking until the last possible moment. And it's all too late when they come knocking. So you've got to think there's another boss in the office next door who's, who's by the end of this week or month or quarter, he's going to want answers or she's going to want answers to uh, why you are or are not achieving what you need to be achieving. Might be your wife. <laughs> yeah, could be your wife. That's probably, in a lot of cases, that might be the case. <laughs> yeah. Now, starting a business on your own, uh, obviously, you need, you need to be, um, you need to, what you said, you need to have, you know, uh, <laughs> the what's the word? Discipline. Discipline. No. That's right. Yeah. yeah. You need to have di <laughs> discipline. Right. So, um, and when you got nobody else around you, um, where do you get that discipline? Right. You need to have a strong why, because that will that will drive us that motivation that will drive that perhaps that discipline too. Um, what is your big audacious why, Matt? Well, my. My goal, my vision for BX is to uh, empower the lives of business owners and entrepreneurs across the globe. Um, so I, I have a it's, a, it's a big BHAG. It's a fairly broad BHAG. Um, but I, and I think we are, I know we are achieving it. Um, we're, we're global now as a, a, officially as of like May and June, we've become a global organization um, now, no longer just in Australia. Um, and we've been signing people up. We've had people from the US and Canada and um, we've got, already got an Indian base um, building at the moment. Uh, we were supposed to launch there this year. I don't think that's going to happen. Sorry for all our Indian fans out there, but I don't think we're going to be able to travel to and from. So it makes it pretty hard, but we will be online over there. Um, and New Zealand, obviously. So we're, you know, we are making a difference globally um, and we're changing the lives of business owners globally. And that's, that's, that's what we're trying to achieve. And that's what we are achieving. And I know we, we will continue doing that. Um, because our ethos is about helping people first. It's about adding value and, you know, empowering the lives of business owners and entrepreneurs first and the rest will come. Uh, and, uh, you know, the discipline is an important part, obviously, 
in terms of achieving it and getting getting um, every step of the way. Because I believe I believe your BHAG is that big goal that's up here and it could be two years away, five years away or whatever. Um, but you've got to have a stepping stone every step of the way. You know, um, no, no one can jump, you know, five years into the future um, in one step, but you can step daily um, and little steps every day. And how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? It's exactly the same with your goals. Um, and that's why I, I write my daily goals down. I have weekly goals. I have monthly goals, quarterly goals, annual goals. And, and they are just those um, stepping stones to my goals along the way that each time I achieve them, I cross them off and I get that little hit of endorphins and dopamine into my bloodstream and I'm, and it mo- motivates me and pushes me through to the next one. And um, yeah. Goal setting is very exciting topic and we could probably have another whole episode on that. I know, I mean, I, I, I love the process of, you know, coming up with something new that you want to develop and, and you, you build that, you know, that 12 months, where do you see that in 12 months? And then you start breaking it down and then you start breaking it monthly, weekly, and then little daily routines. So it's it's awesome when you, when you really put that hard work into it. It actually is not that hard when you have that clarity of like a specific task on that day, like how many emails or how many phone calls you need to do or what you need to do on that day. And then you look at that bigger picture. Oh, okay. Well, this leads to me achieving that monthly thing and then quarterly and then yearly and boom, and I'm there. It's 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 amazing when you do it right. And the and the um, gym industry uh, are the masters of it. Uh, yep. And I know because it's what keeps people coming back to the gym and the, and what you guys are really good at is giving people the vision. So, you know, why are you look, trying to lose weight? Why are you trying to tone up? You know, what is it that's motivating you? Um, is it that body for when you go overseas um, on your, you know, holiday or whatever, or, you know, you've got to be able to, visualize what it is you're trying to achieve and what you're going to look like. Yeah. Um, Connect emotion to it. And, yes. and when you've achieved it, what will that allow you to do? And, and all, so those, funny. all those questions. Yeah. I'm really good at it in my own business, but I remember I, I was at um, a gym I, um, a number of years ago. And when I was just joining, uh, they were doing all the goal setting. I'm like, I don't want to do the goal setting. I know what I want. I just, I know how many times a week I want to come and I know how long I want to do it for. So let's just do that. They're like, no, no, no. We want to do the whole photos and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, I don't want to do any of that. They're like, well, you have to. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and oftentimes you know. what you want is not enough. You got to go deeper. You got to ask yourself maybe like another four levels down, you know, why and then why and then again, why? <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Because the, the, the interesting thing about that goal, that initial goal, especially, you know, typical one, January, right? New Year's resolution. Everybody has a bit of a, you know, six pack goal or, or, or something along those lines. Um, all. <laughs> and, and then it comes February and statistically a lot of people drop off and it's purely because they, they didn't have a, a stronger emotional attachment to that goal. They, they yeah. didn't dig deeper. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I love the branding with BX we you just done earlier this year. Thank you. Um, why? Well, I, I guess the big thing is that uh, uh, there was two reasons. One, that uh, we knew that the branding had been around for about five years and we believe um, like good business strategy is that, you know, every five years or so you should do a rebrand uh, because your brand becomes just a bit stale, a bit old. Um, so we've been around for about five years. Um, but we also, we, we were changing in what we were doing and delivering on and we were, um, delivering in a different, fresher way. And we didn't think the branding uh, actually looked like that. Um, so that was the, really the second part that really our old brand did not uh, conceptualize what we were about. Um, and that was your young, fresh, uh, fun, um, energetic. The old brand was quite a conservative brand with a conservative font. Um, mm. And it, it, that served us then, but it wasn't what we're about now. Uh, and we will probably, if I if I just took the temperature back then compared to now in terms of the average age of our member, um, our average age has dropped by probably about 15 years uh, from then to now, which just goes to show you that an older conservative brand doesn't mirror the general uh, makeup of our members, um, and let alone we just it needed a facelift, it needed a new energy around it. And uh, I'm, I'm actually very excited by the, the change in it. Um, I love and, it. It's great. Uh, yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it's I get a good energy out of it. It's a bit more dynamic, and I think um, a branding as a as an exercise in any business, it's a it's a great marketing opportunity because it's almost like you know like when you're starting a new business when you're like I say a new gym you're doing a 
big open week and and you can like really put money on it and do the whole marketing around it. It's like you just you just waving that hand in in the marketing. Hey, we are here. We are now looking brand new. Come and see us again, or if you haven't, come and see us now because like check us out. You know, we've got a whole new new logo, and, and it's just like it just gives you uh, an opportunity to to have something more ex- like something new, something new exciting. Well, they do marketing. say like uh, Subway used to say if you put up new signs around your shop, you'll get about a 10 to 20% lift in sales. So wow. if you spend 20,000 bucks and redo your shop, you'll get 10 to 20% growth in your business. Uh, like that's the impact that you'll get off the back of that. And that's not even rebranding, but it's just about, you know, changing the look of what you're, of what people see when they look at your business and with a rebrand for your business, that's the, you know, the same thing, you know, like Subway is rebranded, um, a couple of times um, when I, since I was a franchisee um, and I was a franchisee for almost 15 years. So there was two fairly significant rebrands in that process there. And I know that um, for BX, that was a really important um, step for us as well. It was almost like our coming of age, I think, as well. This has been a very big year for BX. Um, you know, we've had you know, 300% growth basically over the past 12 months. Uh, and, uh, you know, so where we are now compared to where we were is, is a totally different business. Um, and I think we just needed a fresh face for that as well. So, yeah, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> no, it's, it's good. I definitely do. Um, Matt, what do you wish you had known when you, when you started your business, when you started with BX? Wow. When I started BX, um, how long it was going to take? <laughs> 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 well, I thought I, um, and how I, it was harder than I originally, um, thought, um, events, you know, there's lots of hard businesses, and but a, a filling rooms is a hard gig. Uh, and yeah, actually, that's a, that's a good one because I actually thought about it the other day. I'm like, hang on, how did he start it? Because I mean, it's a network, but how do you start a network? Do you like go to one coffee shop and invite a couple of business owners and have a gig? <laughs> Basically, you got and it's uh, you know you got to get your first quorum and then go from there and uh, and build. And um, so we launched nine groups. Um, we kicked off with nine groups and and built from there. And I think that uh, we had a big vision for it, but it's, it is, it's you're filling rooms and it's okay to, um, you know, to make mistakes, but you want to minimize the mistakes and, 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 you know, multiply the successes and you want to do it fairly fast. But it's still, I would have thought that we would have been here maybe 18 months ago. Um, but in saying that, at least I know that um, for every competitor out there that, um, is thinking about doing it. It is also just as hard to get started. Um, and I've seen competitors in the past five years, I've seen competitors come and go. And, um, you know, I've, uh, that's, that's a good thing that if I'm in an industry that's hard to get started in, um, I've heard people say, you know, we might do our own local one and I've seen those come and go as well. It just isn't as easy as people think. And, um, you know, if you're in a business and an industry that's got a hard entry point, um, and a hard growth, you know, point for people then that is a good thing um but it's certainly taught me that bx is that's that's been the reality for me as well and it's you know we've we've invested um you know hundreds of thousands of dollars over over the years and, and then some um to build the business um and you know like there's you've got to be able to have that and to work with that and to be able to prepare to invest that and the time and the effort and the energy and the time away from your family um and, you know, I mentioned a wife and three kids. They're a big factor in how I try and run my business as well. Um, but, you know, I, I, set, I set myself up for success because when I had the retail and hospitality, they were 6 a.m. to midnight, seven days a week. Um, now I'm uh, five days a week <laughs> and I got my weekends back. So I'm looking pretty good about now. I was going to ask, uh, actually, um, how do you balance out, you know, your, your business and, and family life? But well, you sort of, I guess, there's no really answered it. <laughs> it's, it's a funny one because I don't believe there's real balance in life or well, balance in the day to day or week to week. I think balance in life. Um, I'll know I'll work really hard now um, and then I'll take a really good holiday um, where I can switch off and I can be 100% uh, with my family. Um, you know, we, we take, you know, a, a four week road trip every year and we, you know, go overseas and stuff like that. To be able to do that um, has its balance. But you need to, you know, also if I'm going to be away, you know, all week, then on the weekend I'm 100% focused on on uh, the family. But if, you know, if I'm 
in and around the house and I can do a few pickups and engage with the kids and stuff like that. I can balance that out as well. So you just, you've got to make it work. Um, but you've got to have the priority with you and the focus on what's important and the family is important. Mm-hmm. Now, one more um, question with back to BX. One thing that um, I was very impressed with was when I, when I joined um, the leadership team and became the experience officer, when I went to the meeting at Tim's house and he started showing me all these spreadsheets and I'm like, where's this from? Oh, he's like, oh, this, that's Matt. That's Matt. So you're a bit of a left brain, aren't you? Well, surprisingly, I am right brain. Um, right. And this is one thing I've taught myself <clears throat> in business that you actually don't get the luxury of just being what you are. You have to push. Um, so I, I, I knew that statistics and figures and understanding the numbers in your business are paramount to success. Um, so I've learned to like and, and to, to understand and to, to take value from the numbers um, but I'm a high, um, high right brain creative person. <laughs> so, so it's interesting that you say that and people would say, Oh, Matt, like he's pretty anal, he's attention to detail and, and that kind of stuff. And, um, I, it makes me laugh cause I'm not, I'm a DI. So I'm a, um, I'm, I'm quite very direct person. Um, and I'm an I as well. So I'm on the, on the disc profile, I'm, I'm the opposite to C, which is the detail oriented. Um, and I'm a right brain person. So it's interesting that that perspective, um, which just goes to show you though, the discipline that you have to have a small business, you don't get the luxury of just going, well, that's just who I am. I'm not going to worry about the numbers. You have to be, uh, um, focus on it. And, um, but I do have good people that help me put it all together. Um, and I believe that, um, it's always better if it's got pretty pictures and graphs to go with it as well. So yeah. that's the right brain in me. <laughs> no, I, gotta, I gotta say, I mean, I saw it. I'm like, wow, that's, that's a very detailed tracking, you know, all the way to tracking attendance and, and each group and everything. I'm like, wow, that's, but I guess that's what it takes. Like yeah. you said, that's, you gotta, you gotta keep an eye out on every group and, 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 and also that helps with your leadership then, because then you can, uh, uh, pick up on, on those uh, areas where it, they need further further help, further leadership and nav- navigation. Absolutely. Um, well, look, we're at the end of the show. It's been amazing to have you on the show today. Um, for anybody listening out there, whether you're in Australia or international, because this is about to you know continue growing international, if you want to get involved with uh, BX Networking, I'm going to put a link in the show notes. But um, uh, Matt, where can people find you? Any any extra things you'd like to add? Oh, look, um, yeah, my personal uh, website is mattalderton.com.au or you can go to bxnetworking.com.au as well, which is our two main websites. Um, you can get me um, at, at Matt Alderton on Facebook as well. So um, find, you'll find me. Yeah, Google me. I, I come up everywhere. <laughs> so if you Google Matt Alderton or BX Networking, um, you'll get a million hits and you'll, uh, you'll be able to track us down there. Um, but uh, yeah, join us for BX Online. There's um, complimentary guest passes um, for any, any of our guests to come along and check it out for the first time. So we'd love to see you there. Um, and uh, yeah, we'd really appreciate, uh, you know, we really appreciate your time this afternoon listening in. So uh, thanks for having us, Pete. Thanks, Matt. Great having you on the show, mate. Cheers. See ya. Bye. Thank you for listening. Uh, you just listened to another great interview on the Success Inspired podcast. All right, people, on the next one, I'm talking to a leading authority on self publishing a book. She has written and published many books on business histories <clears throat> for ASX listed companies, private businesses, and family businesses. Any one of you listening right now, who are passionate about what you do and would love to become a published author, I highly recommend you listen on the next episode of the Success Inspired Podcast. To get notified about all the upcoming episodes and receive more valuable information to help you be more successful, whether in personal, career or business, please make sure to subscribe to my mailing list. There's going to be a link in the show notes somewhere, so I'll just go and search for it. And lastly, I want to make sure you know that Um, you guys enjoyed these interviews so please let me know um, what you think of these and if you want to help me um, you know get more people to listen to this show and and help me you know get more great guests by doing so you can simply you know you can simply go subscribe write and review um, the show on Apple Podcast and you can also let your mates know on the show social um, media Uh, that's it for today once again thank you for listening and have a great rest of your day